Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me to uh, speak here. Uh, I'm Ivan Chua. I'm the head of uh, orthopedic trauma in my hospital. I have a team of uh, five, including myself, uh, trauma surgeons. So happy to deliver this talk here. Um, ileal sacral screw is a workhorse of a percutaneous pelvic fixation. How to make it safe and avoid complications. Um, I remember early on in my career that uh, as a junior consultant having to fix a, a pelvic ring and, uh, with acetabular injury. I spent uh, about more than one hour trying to put an iliosacral screw only to find that after spending almost 10 minutes on the fluoroscopy time putting in the screw and when I looked through the lateral window I could see the screw in front of the sacrum. So what did I do wrong? It's because I failed to recognize a, disform, a very dysmorphic sacrum. So I start with this case. It's a young lady, very memorable. She had a quarrel with her boyfriend and jumped nine stories. She survived. She fractured several areas of her spine, including this uh, pel spinal pelvic dissociation, bilateral sacral fracture. And uh, she fractured both her hind foot, but I won't mention about it. So a year and a half later, after the spine surgeon did this lumbar pelvic fixation, she had sacral non-union on the left side. So this is a 3D scan. You can see on the left side it's not united. And she had pain. She had pain that uh, limited her recovery. So just one cut through the CT. What, what could we do here? Obviously, she had, the pedicle screws were loose and she had pain, so non-union on the left side. She also had a sacral uh, decubitus, large ulcer over the, the buttock, which probably not wise to do an open reduction and uh, do posterior plating and so on. So we had to do something percutaneous. How do we put a screw through? Not easy. There is no S1. S1 is uh, very deformed. There's only S2 left. What complications are we talking about? We've gone through nerve damage, in particular L5, S1, maybe even the rest of the uh, uh, cord equina. Vascular damage, I think uh, SGA has been uh, documented, internal pudendal artery has been documented. Um, we deal with reduction problems, union problems, uh, sometimes we put screw in a, in a corridor that is uh, inadequate um, and a screw failure. I think you all know this, this fellow. He's a uh, famous saying, um, know, know thyself, know thy enemy, a hundred battles, a hundred victories. Whatever the translation, uh, when I Google, I could find like 10 different translations of the same Chinese uh, saying. My interpretation of this, with uh, respect to this topic, you must know the anatomy, know your enemy, know your plan. Maybe uh, you put in 100 screws and 100 screws will survive. So I'd like to draw you to this uh, particular video which I chance upon. And I have to give credit to uh, Professor Rout for his, I actually took a lot of his uh, videos, so I have to give him a lot of credit for that. Um, he, his video is so explicit and so um, educational that you can learn almost everything about this topic from this video. So go look, go look out for it. These are the usual screw trajectories that we put, the sacral screw and the iliosacral screw. Left side is the ilio, typical iliosacral screw trajectory in transverse plane and the uh, sacral screw is usually a transverse plane. So three steps. First, we recognize the dysmorphic anatomy. Then we plan the screw trajectory. And the length, you must know the length. Otherwise, you, if you measure off, you put a 60, you measure off a 60 mm screw and uh, actually on the scan, it should be 80. There's something wrong about it. You need good intraoperative imaging. You need a good team and you need to be able to interpret what you see in order to make uh, the uh, good judgment. So first, sacral dysmorphism, the five features. The upper sacrum, the S1, is often not recessed in the pelvis in a, in a dysmorphic sacrum. Sometimes there's a persistent or S1 disc 
and that could be mammillary bodies. I'll point it out in a while. These are actually persistent transverse processes. The uh, sacral ala is often very small and uh, a very odd shape. And the sacral foramen, which carries, transmit this S1 and S2, they are not cylindrical. They are not tubes at all. They are very big. And it can be present in up to 70% in normal population. In fact, if I go back and re review what I've done in the past, um, I will probably find half of them are from, range from mildly dysmorphic to very dysmorphic. So you've got to be aware of this. And the impact is that usual corridors are often not very possible. You have to amend according to the, uh, the, the, the bone and the anatomy of the S1 and S2 that you see. So if you don't recognize this, there's probably up to say 30% chance of screw malposition and therefore resulting in complications. So first, the S1 is not recessed in. So on the right side, you see the dysmorphic uh, type of sacrum. <clears throat> the S1 is quite high relative to the top of the iliac crest. Number two, the uh, line that you see on the scan, sometimes on the X-ray, tells you there's a persistence of S S1 disc. It just means that the S1 uh, level that you see looks like an L5. It's not like a typical S1 transitional. And then the mammillary bodies are actually, they look a bit like transverse processes. And then the sacred ala is uh, small on the lateral aspect and not so narrow on the transverse. And they're sloping. They're sloping from lateral to medial. They're sloping distal to proximal. And on the anterior aspect, it's very thin. And that's also partly because the sacral foramen is actually abnormally huge. It's not like a tube. It's wide, sometimes sharp, ovoid, and very big. And all this narrows the corridor for you to put screw. So on the transverse cut, you see that on the right side, there is this, uh, there is this indentation. It makes, it makes the corridor extremely narrow. So you may have to put this typical iliosacral screw in a very oblique manner that is uh, on the transverse plane from posterior to anterior and then in the coronal plane from very distal to proximal. And it's usually quite difficult to uh, get the guide wire in such an oblique fashion. Whereas S2 usually is not much a problem and uh, corridors are usually quite wide and open in a transverse manner. Step two. So you've got to study the, X, the scan, plan the screw direction, how many on the transverse plane, on the, on the uh, axial plane, which are the degrees. Even if you can reformat your CT scan, you can look at it in the inland and outlet manner and then you can decide what direction they should be to have the maximum length, to have the maximum number of uh, amount of screw purchase. Sometimes you may decide to put a transsacral, trans ilex screw so you've got to identify which corridor you want to put through. Can you do that safely? And where? Where to start? And where is going to end? And the length. So you've got to plan your reduction techniques needed to get to there. You need to plan. You need a go through halfway and then try iliosacral screw or sacral screw or a, a true and true, trans ilex trans sacral screw. Plan the trajectory. You want to plan in each level. One or two screws or just uh, one screw in S1 and one screw in S2. Sometimes you may need a lot, for, especially for vertical shear or highly comminuted fractures. And what screw caliber? 6.5 or 7.3 cannulated screws. Uh, I personally put, always put 7.3, even in small patients, because the amount of thread that, uh, that, that you need uh, is actually, you have to act, maximize that. So, this diagram shows many possible directions you can do, can use, but some directions are not very achievable. Some directions result in very short screws. Some, if you have to use a trans ilex trans sacral screw, your corridor is actually not very wide. So on the right side of the pictures, you can see that if you decide to go oblique, your corridor is probably wider, so the, you have a less margin, you have a more, more margin for error. But if you decide to go trans sacral trans ilex, your corridor may be as narrow as 10 or 11 millimeters. So you've got to be spot on. This is also from his uh, video. Very, very, very 
you want to see, you look at it, it's very it's straight away, you know. The yellow represents a nerve, the blue represents a body for you to put screws. So it's usually there's a lot of real estate in front, anterior distal. Remember, anterior distal has a lot of real estate, but posterior cephalate is narrow and it's closer to the canal, closer to the nerves. And the yellow tube, uh, I'm sorry, the orange tube represents a conduit for the nerve to pass through. In dysmorphic sacrum, this is not a, this is a tube, it is big and wide. So you've got to recognize this and then look for the, imagine this, the, the oval cylinder is for where, where you put screw in S1 as well as S2. If you follow this, his video, uh, Professor Rao says that you can put two screws in each level. So on the left, on this set of images, the normal anatomy. So you can put two screws even. So that you aim for the first screw should start in where the real estate is the most. That means distal, uh, that means caudal anterior. Okay, remember caudal anterior. Okay, for the first for the first wire, caudal anterior. And then this, even for S2, you can do the same thing too. So the third step, step three, positioning is is key actually. I often put a bump depending on the size of the patient so that you can do your inlet outlet view properly not in some weird uh, angle sometimes you do outlet that's almost horizontal it's not very you can't read at all and very difficult to interpret so you may have to put a bump to smoothen out the, uh, the sacred, sacred tilt <clears throat> and then you have to interpret you have to obtain a good inlet outlet as well as lateral note the degrees the degree at the tilt to the vertical so that your radiographer knows exactly what to do for you. Then this is what I do. I usually get positioned nicely and then I start with knowing where the inlet outlet views. I mark them on the patient. The wires here represent the angle. They are not at right angle to each other. They never are. So you move them. Next, these are the directions. I move the wire so that I know what I'm seeing on screen is what I, what I see inside. So I move the wire. If I start like that, I move the wire posteriorly. You see on the inlet view, this is what happens. And on the outlet, if I move anteriorly along that plane, and this is how the wire behaves. Conversely, on the outlet view, this is what happens. If I start here, you have move, move uh, anteriorly, it moves up. It's this way and backwards. So you combine both factors together, it should be able to position the wire at a good start point according to your plan. Okay, make sure the wire stays within the corridor. In this case, the wire is a little bit posterior, but I accepted it anyway. So I like to do this because the ileal cortical density is often very hard to get because the pelvis is tilted, sometimes the pelvis is displaced. You often have to tie on one leg so that you can get both to match up. So in this, in this particular patient, both ICDs actually managed to line up pretty nicely. So you've got to get a wire posterior to the ICD, everybody knows that. But on which plane you turn a try image? Here I'm trying to put almost a transverse, transverse uh, screw. So I, at the wire tip, I stop at where L5 root is. Because we are all afraid of penetrating the anterior co uh, cortex of the S1. So I stopped there, I checked. The if the wire tip is posterior to the ICD, has to be inside the bone corridor. So this, this, this is one, one, one trick that I use often. And of course, if your hospital is very blessed to have intraop CT, good, you verify. Put a wire, you scan it, it tells you exactly it's in the right spot. Have you penetrated the cortex? And then this is the O arm. If it has navigation, even better. So in this case, this was a very dysmorphic uh, pelvis I had to do fairly recently. Um, she had this. On the CT scan, you can see that the sacral ala is quite dysmorphic. The eight, the, there's a mammillary body. The, the sacrum is quite high relative to the top of the iliac crest. S1 on the normal unfractured side is uh, actually quite wide. So the corridor is actually very narrow. So on this, you can actually see that the wire is actually not in a typical um, sacral eyelid manner. It's actually more oblique than usual. So it took, it, it, you have to navigate, I straight, uh, once I recognize the dysmorphic sacrum, I plan to do the navigation straight away.
save time. Of course, there is a setup time of about 20 minutes or so. So you guys see that I put both screws in the right corridor, and they trans I like trans sacred screw. This is a LC3. Now back to the case where I started with. This is the 3D scan, and then. After analyzing the scans for about half an hour, I figured that there was only one corridor that measures nine millimeters wide for me to put a trans electron sacred screw, where the spine surgeon will take out the implants because she has symptomatic hardware, and then do a, 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 a decortication behind and add bone graft posteriorly. So we did this together, and then after the implants came out, decorticated the back, added a lot of bone graft under. Un, uh, over, over the bone, and then I had to navigate this screw across. So I used the Medtronic plus a stealth station. This is the older, over, older version. Usually the spine surgeons use that a lot. Um, I have, usually I don't get a chance to use it. So this case was planned months in advance. So in this, this is the intra-op scan showing that I got a wire right where I should be. I, I have uh, intended it to be and then the screw across. There's only one chance, so it has to be precise. And then the pain disappeared. In fact, she walked in, she was so, so cheerful, she walked in and she went back to Pilates in, within three months. Before that, she couldn't, she couldn't do anything. So, back to the summary. We, we must know the anatomy. Know what is this morphing. Okay, expect it. Plan. Plan the trajectory. Plan your reduction maneuver. Plan the length. And then you execute it. If CT is available, interop CT is available, or even computer navigation is available, that's an absolute bonus. So, thank you, everybody. Um, 2024 is uh, our uh, annual scientific meeting in trauma. We welcome you to Singapore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yuan Shua, an excellent talk.